Dallas. <laughs> I don't feel too well. Hello, everyone. In this episode, the third episode of Dictate, Dissect, and Discuss, we will be covering Cats, Not War. Now, I confess that in my notes, I actually didn't name the uh, the author of this set of blog posts by name because it I just couldn't find the name of the person. Turns out the man's name is Patrick Higgins, but I don't know if he's the owner of this blog or maybe he's just one of the contributors to the blog because this blog, as you can see, is not in existence anymore, at least not in this form. It's not catsnotwar.blogspot.com anymore. I don't know when this was taken down. So since we only have the archival images of it, I'm going to go ahead and assume A, that this was his blog, <laughs> and B, that he is indeed the sole author of this blog, which means he's the author of this and everything else is his as well. So all these ideas are his and what have you. So this is Cats Not War Part 1. And there are three parts to this, so there are going to be three separate videos. This is the first part. Don't ask why there's weird Arabic writing here. I don't really know. Okay. Cats Not War Part 1 the Intercepts Interference, Notes on Media, Capitalism, and Imperialism. We're really on quite an imperialism kick nowadays. <laughs> oh, and my apologies if the text is quite small or hard to see. This is probably one of those episodes where since the quality and the text size is less than great and not very big, you may just want to listen to this one. Anyway, proceeding on. 1. His major, as in Ames, uh, I think his name's pronounced Ames, Mark Ames, uh, he's a reporter that had reported on this incident. His major, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, Omidyar? piece was a response to Greenwald employee Marcy Wheeler's questions about whether there was imperialist meddling going on in Ukraine leading up to and in the wake of the ousting of Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych. Among the investors in such a cause, Ames discovered, was Greenwald and Wheeler's boss, Omid Yar, who along with the U.S. government invested in an NGO situated against the Russia-allied rival state of Yanukovych. By the way, uh, it seems Patrick Higgins actually misspelled Yanukovych there as Yunukovych. It's actually Yanukovych. I don't know. Guess there was a dyslexia moment there. Anyway. Like most NGOs, this one ran on the promise of transparency, human rights, and the empowerment of grassroots civil society. The responses of both Greenwald and Wheeler boasted an aw shucks brand of cluelessness about the purpose and functionality of this particular NGO, and therefore of NGOs in general. So, Amos has revealed clearly the tendency within the media class to feign cluelessness about things they would otherwise have a clue about once the offender is their financial backer. To start with, the writer describes the main hinge of the article. Mark Ames, a journalist and rival of Glenn Greenwald, made a piece responding to another Intercept journalist, Marcy Wheeler's questions about the involvement of foreign meddling in Ukraine's unrest and ousting of its then-president, Viktor Yanukovych. Peter Omidyar, founder of First Look Media, The Intercept, and even eBay, and the employer of Greenwald and Wheeler was a member of an NGO that acted in tandem with the U.S. government to stand opposed to Yanukovych because he was Russia sympathetic. As the writer posits, NGOs are soft imperialist arms of the U.S. government. 
and this is problematic. The head of a media empire or a journalist should not be in bed with the U.S. government full stop. And this is not even to speak of embedded journalism, which I could have talked about in this, but I didn't. Maybe we'll do it in a future episode. What's worse is that neither employee knew what was going on, or so they claimed. It is very disconcerting to see news media, a source of supposed objectivity, truth, and justice, forgetting key details when it comes to money and their own bosses or company. Two, despite it being publicly disclosed, I was not previously aware that the Omidyar network donated to this Ukrainian group, he writes, being Greenwald. His lack of knowledge of the group in question doesn't stop there. Quote, I know very little about the specific Ukrainian group at issue here, end quote. In fact, Greenwald knows so little that he doesn't even know there's something to know. Quote, to be honest, I barely know what it is I'm supposed to be boldly coming forth and addressing, end quote. Exasperated, Greenwald asked for some help. Quote, Can someone succinctly explain why this is a scandal that needs to be addressed, particularly by first-look journalists? End quote. So, the author quotes Greenwald, who seems to know nothing about anything, as the author clearly deduced. This is concerning because not only does he not understand the purpose of that NGO that was supposedly meddling in Ukraine's national affairs, he doesn't know the greater purpose of NGOs or why he should even address these accusations in print. I would think that a man who covers international news in a big journal should have some intellectual curiosity in relation to his assignment. Even if it isn't his assignment, shouldn't he take that time to investigate a little? You know, like a reporter does when something fishy is afoot. Come on, be more like Carl Kolchak, Glenn. <laughs> it's almost impossible he wouldn't at least have some idea about NGOs and their purpose overseas or that particular NGO's purpose, even if, and this is a big to his boss. Three. First, there's Greenwald's grand diversion of asking why Ukraine is even being mentioned. It's diversion because the series of questions pivots away from Ames' claims, and even away from Ames himself, to focus on crowds and their views on Ukraine. Quote, Wasn't it just 72 hours ago that the widespread mainstream view in the West, not one that I shared, was that there was a profound moral obligation to stand up and support the brave and noble Ukrainian opposition forces as they fight to be liberated from the brutal and repressive regime imposed on them by Vladimir Putin's puppet. When did it suddenly become shameful to support those very same opposition forces?" End quote. The injection of this text is weird because Ames very clearly never implied any of those things and actually wrote a piece to break up both of those impressions. Greenwald, instead of addressing why and how he had come to ignore or conveniently forget about Omidyar's imperialist arm butting into Ukraine's affairs, he begs the question of why it's bad to support the oppositional forces contrary to popular public opinion, i.e., why he needs to go to bat for the noble Ukrainian fighters digging themselves out from under the boot of Yanukovych. First, his language is deliberately overemphasized with that kind of stunning and brave language in order to make it seem unpalatable. Second, it's a pivot. Just because you're a contrarian in this case, doesn't mean you can't be aware of what your backers are doing. This NGO doesn't seem so transparent after all. Second, Greenwald not only refuses in the piece to say Omid Yar was up to no good in Ukraine, he fails to even wonder whether Omid Yar was doing something other than those wonderful things he claims he was doing. You know, transparency, 
human rights, grassroots civil society. However, he might be at one point come close to implying Omidyar was up to no good. Oh, by the way, this is number four, sorry. <laughs> Quote, are Chris Hayes and Rachel Maddow responsible for all the bad acts of Comcast, which owns MSNBC, or is their journalism impugned by those bad acts? End quote, he asks. I take this to imply either that Omid Yar was up to bad acts and it doesn't matter, or that even if Omid Yar was up to bad acts, it wouldn't matter. The question becomes not whether Hayes and Maddow are morally responsible for Comcast, but whether we could expect reporting on or honest acknowledgement of Comcast bad acts from the likes of Hayes and Maddow. But what matters here is whether the dirty money in question is causing Glenn Greenwald and Marcy Wheeler to run interference on a rich man's behalf. And yes, that is what's happening. And since the rich man in question has demonstrably been involved in funding imperialist activities, they are, by extension, running interference on imperialism's behalf. Greenwald, again, has no intellectual curiosity or desire to investigate the charges levied against him. Why would he care about Omid Yar's business in Ukraine, which he didn't even know about, remember? because that's not his problem. He trusts that Omid Yar is just there to invest in his own kind-hearted interest of freedom, democracy, transparency, and support of grassroots movements. Huh. Sounds like all the buds words the U.S. stickers onto their brand of imperialism salad. He then goes on to ask if people like Rachel Maddow are responsible for their superiors' questionable endeavors. First of all, Maybe not responsible, but they should at least have an idea or, at the very least, look into it if prompted. But Greenwald, as the writer points out, is in all likelihood asking this question rhetorically. He doesn't think they should. Full stop. What Greenwald is implying is, in legal terms, and now I can break out the Perry Mason Latin, respondiat superior, or let the master answer. Invoking this, the superior, a boss, manager, admin, becomes culpable for the acts of their employees, though, in this case, I suppose it's a reverse respondiat superior that Greenwald is insinuating, if such a thing is existent. There's also, in the realm of vicarious liability, qui facit per aluim facit per se, Latin for he who acts through another does the act himself, and I apologize for that bad Latin there. <laughs> Which is pretty much what it says on the tin. Greenwald doesn't expect Hayes or Maddow to take the blame or need to honestly report on their superiors' misdeeds, nor should they care. He doesn't want affiliates like himself to hold a moral responsibility. I call this radical personal responsibility. You are only responsible for yourself and no one else even if your words, actions, and behaviors have caused bad externalities to happen. Five. Greenwald asserts that he doesn't have to care because Omidyar has granted him full editorial independence. This is the most troubling claim of all, encapsulated perfectly in the absurdity of a reporter so incurious he can't even be bothered to research his employer's politics and investments. Note that we aren't talking about whether Omid Yar simply holds an opinion about something. Rather, we're talking about a rich man putting considerable capital behind his opinions. So, this is a pretty obvious summation on all counts. Wheeler and Greenwald are so uninterested in analyzing their own involvement in being the proxy shields for Omid Yar's imperialism that they just shrug their shoulders and go, well, I'm an independent free thinker with too much work on my hands to investigate my boss, whom I trust is just doing boring boss things. Why would he have a reason to fund an NGO meddling in Ukrainian political affairs? 
Again, the lack of intellectual curiosity is astounding. <laughs> to lend a softer hand to these two reporters, I don't think they want to fund imperialism or make tons of money off the backs of political instability. That being said, they could at least make more coherent arguments or simply keep out of the crossfire until things die down. Six. Ames dug this information up about Omid Yar at Wheeler's Curiosity. Viewing the Ukrainian fray, she clearly knew dirty tricks by their effects and felt compelled to ask about them in public. When Ames revealed that one such meddler was her boss, she employed a new skepticism about the existence of imperial meddling in Ukraine, writing, quote, I don't see any evidence that Omid Yar's donations were explicitly intended to pay for regime change. Unless you presume transparency and better governance equates to regime change. End quote. Asking what is wrong about PACT, the Omid Yar funded NGO, promoting women in leadership, a goal PACT offers up on its about, uh, <clears throat> offers up on its about page. Clearly the only place to go when seeking to understand an institution's true workings. The, the insinuation of conspiracism mimics Greenwald's own when he reduces Ames' charges to the, quote, laughable hyperbole that Omid Yar is now the mastermind who has secretly engineered the Ukrainian uprising, end quote. To Greenwald, I'd like to ask, but what if, like, the suggestion is not that Omid Yar did anything alone, but that he belongs to a larger oligarchical state network whose global investments make up that thing called imperialism. And to Wheeler, I'd like to ask, what if, like, an NGO doesn't outright come out with goals of regime change because they are manifestations of soft imperialism, crucial supplements to the harder stuff that use a language of liberal abstractions to work towards goals more nefarious? Wheeler is engaging in a level of obfuscating that I didn't think was possible. She looks at the surface level and concludes that because the NGO doesn't say anything about supporting overt regime change on their website, means that there is nothing to disparage about Omid Yar's meddling. For all her intents and purposes, her boss was just trying to organize a task force for a grassroots political activity and peaceful democratic blah blah blah. It's laughably simple-minded. She also falls into the old girl boss trap of an NGO promoting soft imperialism aims like women in leadership is some great progressive thing when it comes at the hands of a coup. Greenwald jumps in to say that Ames must think Omid Yar is the man behind the curtain, pointing to Ames as an alarmist laughingstock. Omid Yar is just another businessman who wants a cut of the profits, as the writer says. And he's right. Seven. Hobson's argument about the emergence of British imperialism of his age goes like this. It was distinct from colonialism of old in that, within subject countries, quote, no significant portion of the population consists of settlers living with their families in accordance with the social and political customs of law of their native land. In most instances, they form a small minority wielding political or economic sway over a majority of alien and subject people." End quote. Imperialism, Hobson answers, comes at a stage of capitalist overproduction in the developed countries, which leads to superflu superfluous capital. This capital is then reinvested into imposed and growing money money markets overseas so as to increase profits. Imperialism rose in tangent with financial capital, so while state subsidized military power is the most obvious expression of imperialism, Finance constitutes its leading beneficiary. In 
In the next episode, we'll surely see more of Money Money Markets and Superfluous Capital, but for the moment, let's try to understand Hobson's words. Imperialism engenders itself to capitalism because it's one step above colonialism and much better than colonialism could ever hope to be. Instead of needing to live amongst your conquered people, you just invade, steal their resources, invest in their markets, and reap the spoils while staying clean. Eight. Imperialism is, rather, the employment of superfluous capital into global and necessarily, or the ruling class that is, expanding finance markets accomplished through the mass denial of self-determination because expanding into overseas markets has nothing to do with meeting human need, it becomes necessary to say that the purpose of imperialism is nothing less than the maintenance of class society itself. The creation of financial capital is thus one of monopolization and centralization, so that the more imperialism increases, the higher concentration of capital in a smaller number of hands. So, if a state is not fully incorporated into global, read imperialist, markets, it places itself within the crosshairs of a destabilization campaign. Echoing back to Parenti, we can see that imperialism aims to infiltrate global markets that are not accessible to U.S. financial interests so the ruling elite can insert their claws into centralized markets. To do that though, some unpleasant human rights violations must be undertaken. And that, like most billionaires, there's nothing worthy of creation happening. In fact, capital accumulation happens at a much slower rate when someone makes and sells a product rather than just cashing in on the free flow of money that already exists somewhere like in the recently destabilized market of a country like Syria, Libya, or Ukraine. Nine, Omid Yar just so happens to be investing money into an organization agitating against a rival state of the US empire and the U.S. empire itself just so happens to be investing in that same organization. Ames' work gives us an example of so-called private capital and so-called state capital going into the same cause, the same way Saudi private capital and Saudi state capital and weapons both go into Syrian rebels. I'm proposing that that cause here is the widening of money money markets in Ukraine that would benefit both Omidyar, the billionaire, and the US empire. If the empire benefits, then the oligarchical citizen of the empire benefits. Simple enough. One of Umberto Eco's boxes on the checklist of fascism is when a state collaborates in control with the machination of private corporations and investors, somebody like Omidyar and his affiliated NGO. Capital accumulation cannot survive without a constant stream of bodies, so we can see that the aim of an organization like that NGO is to capitalize on the instability in Ukraine to open up another niche for Omidyar and the military industrial complex and its beneficiaries to make money. Ten. This coincided with the zeitgeist he was designed to serve, the social carving for a well-spoken and worldly seeming anti-Bush who might restore some sense of American sophistication. Obama made the empire less clustered, more spread out, more strategically distributed. This means that covert black ops are in fuller effect. Special forces are expanding in Central and South America, in Africa, in East Asia, 
you name it. By making it harder to see just what kind of destruction is being wrought by our corporate overlords, Obama succeeded where Bush couldn't. He scattered the military to the winds and hid it under sides of unrest in multiple continents. Syria still raged on, Iraq still raged on, you get the picture. If he truly did end up putting a stop to the war machine in any capacity, we could measure the earnings of Lockheed Martin's execs in those years and see a drop in profits. But we didn't. And those people are still billionaires. Eleven. NGOs function as a soft wing of that rule. Israel loves itself some NGOs because not only do they take off some of the aid burdens, but they have also replaced the Israeli working class in the role of organizing against the Zionist state. Now, Palestinians are stuck with a surplus of upper middle class American undergrads equipped only with resumes and free Palestine shirt buttons, fully prepared to promote some human rights before their final semester kicks in. And that is one part of the PSYOP aspects of NGOs. They disrupt class struggle by interfering with class consciousness through a liberal rhetoric of human rights. And sometimes, as in Haiti for another example, NGOs play an overt role in coups. And wouldn't you just happen to know that they use phrases employed by the Omid Yar's NGO? Grassroots and a promising civil society movement. NGOs are the soft wing of imperialism, as the author states. Israel and the U.S., longtime allies, kill two birds with one stone. While Israel leverages ethnic cleansing against the Palestinian people, they can have ineffectual help in the form of these NGOs displayed on their TV and US TV. Although in both cases, US viewers will say, wow, look at those brave yet crazy souls trying to hashtag free Palestine. Whereas Israeli TV viewers will say, depending on their political proclivities, Wow, yet another U.S. aid org doing the same thing the other one did, i.e. not promoting meaningful change. Or, yeah, the IDF can crush those guys easily. How is that supposed to radicalize anyone into helping in a more productive, non-imperialist way? 12. The explicit role of Omid Yar's NGO seems to have been to A. Prop up liberal frontmen for an alternative regime, as AMS detailed, and B, to launch PSYOPs. For example, in Colombia, where U.S. Special Forces are moving with their locally trained forces, the Junglas, <laughs> sorry, my Spanish isn't good, through the jungle, they come across a poor rural family they might offer the kids some soccer balls or offer to build a basketball court or rebuild their housing facilities. The point of the operation is to attempt to gain pro-U.S. sympathies of a local population. The larger strategy is anti-Venezuelan and anti-labor. Anybody care to count the amount of transparency NGOs swarming about in Venezuela in comparison to those in Colombia? Think of the larger strategy in regards to the Ukrainian context, anti-Russian and pursuant to eastward expansion, the original raison d'etre of NATO. Then, remember that Ames had demonstrated elsewhere, years in advance of these current events, that the United States' main liberal frontman Viktor Yushchenko had been rehabilitating a fascist figure, Stepan Bandera of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, or the OUN, in a move that had been stirring up neo-Nazi sentiments along the Ukrainian populace. In Libya, it's bourgeois democracy in the newspapers, Salafism in the streets. Likewise, in Ukraine, bourgeois democracy in the newspapers, 
neo-Nazism in the streets. Welcome to Pax Americana. And if we accept that neo-Nazis played a significant part of the protest, and we accept that Umid Yar's NGO has played a big role in getting protest up and running, then we have a complete enough picture. To use phrases from Machiavelli, it's always better to appear clement and kind even if you don't mean it. I posit that what we love can kill us faster than what we hate. If you see a bunch of ordinary people suddenly infiltrating your communities with a certain agenda to push, you would be wise, like those Colombians, to beware. Because passing off an alternative of food, water, and shelter under the guise of an underhanded deal is very, very dirty. It's never a no-strings-attached altruism. That isn't to say that everybody trying to improve a foreigner's quality of life through aid is evil. Far from it. Nevertheless, oligarchs like Omidyar stand to profit from people's happiness while reaping the seeds of their country's economic collapse and material instability. And finally, 13. What cannot be in doubt, however, is that no NGO funded by oligarchs and empire is remotely interested in democracy, freedom, dignity, or any other fluffy abstractions you can possibly whisper. And this is just a nice summary wrap-up sentence. Okay, everyone. Thank you for watching. Next episode will be Cats Not War Part 2. And after that, Cats Not War Part 3, which will be the last one in this mini-series on Cats Not War, The Intercepts Interference, Notes on Media, Capitalism, and Imperialism. See you all next time.